Hello! <laughs> Welcome back to the A to Z of archaeology. Now, um, unfortunately, there's been a, a bit of a, a hazard um, arise here at Archaeo Soup Towers, a bit of an accident, um, but this week's letter is the letter U, and that means we're going to be talking about underwater archaeology, and what more um, could we want, I suppose, than water, water all around. Um, anyway, uh, while you hear a bit more about underwater archaeology, I'm just going to go and fix the leak. Underwater archaeology is, as its name suggests, archaeology done underwater. You may be wondering at this stage if there's anything worthwhile finding underwater. The answer is yes, there's lots to find. Some of the most dramatic events in human history took place on the water, and therefore the remains of these events are often found underwater. This is the essence of underwater archaeology. And it's not just on the water. Where the water meets the land is also inherently dramatic. Battles take place, trade arrives, people emigrate and immigrate, and occasionally people even decide to live above the water on the water's edge. So underwater archaeology is vital. This is particularly true in the UK as we are after all an island surrounded by water. Whoa. Oh, blimey. Oh, that's better. Anyway, now that I'm dried off, underwater archaeology presents a unique set of challenges to the archaeologist, uh, not least because of the environment in which he or she finds themselves working. Um, it's, it, it, even though some of the techniques are very, very similar to archaeology on land, on dry land, um, there's also many other obstacles and um, particular challenges presented by the environment which have to be overcome in sometimes very, very ingenious ways. The first challenge which faces an underwater archaeologist is finding their site. This is comparatively easy on land, whereas underwater it requires lengthy surveys. Sonar surveys are just one way of locating an underwater archaeological site. There are a plethora of cameras and probes which are used at this stage of the investigation. Once a site has been located, its position is tagged using GPS and it is carefully measured. After all, on land you don't have tides and currents taking you off track. Recording the site in situ is just as important underwater as it is on the land, and this is undertaken with the same care and attention as on any other excavation. Excavation, however, does require specialised tools, such as industrial strength vacuums to suck away silt from the site in order to better see what's there. Occasionally, heavy machinery is used to remove concretions from metallic items. And fighting against the tide and fresh waves of silt every day, eventually the site is revealed. Occasionally, large pieces of archaeology will be recovered using heavy-duty balloons, as seen here. However, more often than not, the archaeology is of a more regular size. The artefacts are cleaned and carefully recorded, and as with any other archaeological site, eventually a plan of this site and a publication will be made explaining what was found. It is also worth noting that there is an intertidal form of archaeology, which takes place between the tides. This often uncovers features such as ancient harbours and ports, or, as here, a medieval fishing trap, which is extremely well preserved because of the waterlogged soil. Again, because of its very nature, um, underwater archaeology actually has been responsible for some remarkable finds, and uh, in, in many cases uh, this uh, material can only have come from underwater. On the 19th of July, 1545, the pride of King Henry VIII's fleet, the Mary Rose, was sunk, and to all intents and purposes, lost forever. There she lay until the 1830s, when a group of divers decided to see if they could explore the wreck. The Mary Rose was largely forgotten again, until she was rediscovered in 1971, and excavated by a team of archaeologists from the UK. This excavation inspired a generation, and recovered many fascinating artefacts from King Henry VIII's flagship. Eventually, in 1982, the decision was taken to recover part of the hull and bring it to the surface. The remains were displayed in Portsmouth, constantly sprayed with a polyethylene glycol solution to preserve them. The hull was closed in 2009, in order to be revamped and reopened in 2012. However, the English Channel is more than just the resting place of the Mary Rose. 
During the Second World War, many thousands of ships, submarines and aeroplanes were lost in combat over these waters. To this day, the location of the wreckage of many of these vehicles is recorded by archaeologists. Earlier this year, the location of a bomber from the Luftwaffe, which went down in the English Channel, was located using sonar. However, rest assured that for the most part these sites are not excavated, as they hold the same status as a military graveyard. Underwater archaeology is not just restricted to the English Channel. In Scotland, the study of Cranogs has been greatly advanced through underwater archaeological techniques. By studying the mounds left behind by their ruins, we have gained a greater understanding of how these people lived above the water. Underwater archaeology helps us to locate the original footings of Roman bridges. It has helped us to find objects which have been deposited many thousands of years ago into rivers, and it helps us every day on the shorelines of rivers up and down the country to better understand the history of that river, and therefore the history of the people living around the river. So underwater archaeology is yet another vital facet of the world of archaeology. Um, this is partly because of uh, the environment in which the archaeology sits. Water itself often helps to preserve artefacts in their most remarkable state. Um, but also as well, it's, it's un underwater archaeology is incredible because until recently we haven't had the technology to, to do excavations um, uh, on such an exacting standard as we have had in the past 30 years. Underwater archaeology in this way is relatively new but the, um, the finds and the strides that it continues to make in its field um, often are awe-inspiring and almost always surprising. So that's been you, Underwater Archaeology. Um, I hope you found this video interesting and useful, or useful perhaps, I don't know. Um, feel free to comment below. Um, of course, please do subscribe to the channel by clicking on the button above. Um, if you have any questions, feel free just to send it my way using the archaeosoup at gmail.com email address as displayed on the home page. And I will get back to you in uh, the Questions of Doom um, video series on here. Uh, also, please do search for us on Facebook. All you need to do is look for Archaeosoup Productions and click like. And often, stories which I can't fit onto here make it onto the Facebook page instead. So, um, until next time, thank you very much for watching.